What's up, everybody? Matt Kajeski here, back again with the awesome channel, talking some college basketball DFS ahead of a Super Tuesday on March the 1st. Before we get started, today's stream is brought to you by Monkey Knife Fight. And make sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell before this and all other content goes live. Tonight, we have a 10-game main site, so we will jump right into it. There's also a four-game late site, which we won't cover on the video, but projections will be updated for that and data as well, which you will see on the screen. And I'll take you behind the glass, giving you a peek at our data, which you can find on the site. It has everything from Vegas totals, offensive, defensive environments, how these teams stack up, margin of victory, and then, of course, our usage stats along with minutes, everything you need for college basketball DFS. And our first game on the board is Tennessee taking on Georgia. This is a potential blowout spot for Tennessee. Maybe a look ahead to with Georgia just being the worst team in the SEC and Tennessee being a 15 and a half point favorite with a 145 and a half point total overall. That's great for Tennessee, an 80 and a half point total, but there is a blowout risk with all their players here. So guys like Santiago Viscovi, Kennedy Chandler, two of the main minute getters for the team look a little overpriced in this spot. You also have Josiah Jordan James playing over 30 minutes a game. With the injury to Olivier Kamhua, he's been forced into elevated minutes here. But I think you could see guys like Brandon Huntley Hatfield step up and play 20 plus just with the blowout risk. It's honestly a spot where I'm probably not playing anyone on Tennessee. And if I was, probably just looking at usage leader Kennedy Chandler with his 21 and a half percent shot rate over the last three. On the Georgia side, even though they don't have great implied team totals and they're constantly double digit underdogs, they have condensed their minutes and their usage between a couple guys. Cairo Oquendo at 7,400 is a guy that's going to play every single minute. He has a 36 and a half percent shot rate last three and a 25 and a half percent rebound rate. Obviously he runs the risk of Georgia getting blown out, playing reduced minutes, but at the same time their season's lost and there's no reason to not play these guys at this point. So a Quendo, Braylon Bridges, even an Aaron Cook who's played 35, 39, and 23 minutes last three. Those are players to consider, but overall, probably not the best game environment because of the blowout risk. Game two is Providence taking on Villanova. 10 points spread in favor of Villanova, a 134.5 point total. Providence, 62 points implied team total. Not great here against the Villanova team that's going to slow them down, but Providence has been fantastic. You have Aljami, Aljami Durham returning to the lineup. He's not played two games. I think you could see his rates spike at the expense of Jared Bynum, who has kind of been the usage leader for this team since Durham got injured. You also have guys like Nate Watson and Horkler in the interior. Don't love them against Nova, but a guy like Horkler does have a 27% rebound rate last three, but implied team total super low here. For Nova, Gillespie and Justin Moore continue to play through injury, continue to play 36 plus minutes and both of their usage rates are kind of back to where their season averages were, if not better, Justin Moore, 26% shot rate, nearly 22% rebound rate and a 17% assist rate last three. That's very solid metrics here. Now Providence plays good defense. Nova implied for 72.25 team total. I think you could take a stab at Justin Moore here. He's not too expensive. Otherwise, you're probably just looking at a guy like Brandon Slater because of the minutes he plays. But still, so many of the shots and rebounds are going through Moore and Gillespie. I'm not sure you want to play any of the ancillary options for Nova. So I'm isolating Moore, maybe taking a stab on Gillespie, and probably moving on from the game. Game three is Ole Miss taking on Kentucky. Another potential blowout spot with Kentucky being a 17-point favorite, 141.5 point total. On Ole Miss, they recently expanded their rotation in a 10-point loss, which is interesting, but they're playing for nothing here. They cut the minutes for Nicier Brooks, even though he wasn't in foul trouble. So these are all concerns. Ty Fagan saw a huge bump in minutes. He's 4,900, a potential value piece if you think he continues to play that amount of time. I personally think this is a very volatile situation and one that I don't really want to target. Even a guy like Jamin Brakefield, who had been a 30-minute per game guy, has now played 18 and 20 minutes in back-to-back -back games. So Ole Miss just expanding their rotation. I think it was condensed largely because of injury. But at this point in the season, nothing really left for them to play for. You could just see them continue to mess around. And that's a tough thing to ask against a very strong Kentucky team. On the Kentucky side, you have a huge implied team total, but also the risk of blowout. Oscar Shibwe is now 10.5K on DraftKings, more expensive than even Keegan Murray was in their most recent contest. And it's well warranted. In games where they're competitive, Shibwe is playing every single minute. 
in the last three, he has a 23% shot rate, a 48% rebound rate, and a 15.5% assist rate. The entire offense is flowing through Shibway right now. It's just with Kentucky trying to make a stand in the tournament this year and in the conference tournament, I don't know if playing him 39 minutes against Ole Miss is a 17-point favorite or something we can expect. So I'm projecting Shibway closer to 30 minutes, still very efficient in his rates, but you might get more bang for your buck playing other studs. You also have players like Ty Ty Washington, extremely cheap, but battling an injury. He played 35 minutes in their most recent game. I think it's more than likely he's limited here. So even though the price is phenomenal on Ty Ty, how many minutes does he actually receive? Same thing with Severe Wheeler. If I'm playing anyone on Kentucky, it is Ty Ty exclusively because of his price. Going to game three, Missouri taking on South Carolina. This is a gross game in the SEC. Six and a half point spread in favor of South Carolina, 136 total. South Carolina would be a team to potentially look at, but they run a pretty nasty rotation. It's about 10 to 12 players on any given slate. They have narrowed their minutes a little bit between players like Eric Stevenson. James Reese has actually played 34, 32, and 30 minutes in their last three. And Jermaine Cuisinart, he's up around 30 minutes on any given slate as well, and he has a 27% shot rate last three. James Reese has played really well, and he has a 20% shot rate last three, so I think he's somebody to maybe look at in GPPs in the mid-fives, 5.3K for him, which is a suitable price tag. But you're always worried about rates with the South Carolina rotation. You're always worried about minutes. The situation is constantly in flux. So they're a little difficult to get to. But for me, it's probably James Reese tentatively. On the Missouri side, they're a slight underdog here, but their implied team total still sitting around 65 points. Javon Pickett's really been the usage monster for this team. And he's somebody I have a little bit of interest in. South Carolina does play solid defense overall, but the spread is tight in this game, and the pace is actually a little above average. So Javon Pickett's played 39, 36, and 35 minutes last three. He has a 25.3% shot rate, 11% rebound rate, and a 37% assist rate. The entire offense is flowing through Javon Pickett right now, and he's cheap enough where I'm not sure you need to consider the ancillary options here. Amari Davis, maybe at 4,300, could be a potential value, but I think you can just isolate Javon Pickett and play one player from this game. And he's the one I have the most confidence in. West Virginia taking on Oklahoma. A similar contest here, Oklahoma, the five and a half point favorite. West Virginia quickly taking money though, in the spread or the total here, 135 and a half. On West Virginia, it's basically a two man show in Taz Sherman and Sean McNeil. He's priced egregiously here, even though he's played 31 and 34 minutes in back to back games. It was in the doghouse for a little bit, but his season long rates are supremely better than his last three. I think he's a buy low and that's reflected in his price at 4,500 still West Virginia 65 implied team total. So I'm not necessarily sure you need to get there, but just want to mention him as a sub five K player to consider Taz always has the elite shot rate and he basically does nothing else. If he's hot, he could be a good play. If not, you're probably regretting playing him. Everybody else is just so volatile in minutes. Malik Curry, third most recent game, nine minutes, most recent game, 28. Jalen Bridges, most recent game, 14. Third most recent game, 28. Kadarian Johnson, eight minutes, 33. You can see West Virginia just has no consistency outside of Taz and Sean McNeil. For Oklahoma, this team is extremely banged up. Elijah Harkless out for the year. CJ Nolan did not play in their last game, did not see anything about him, but he's about a 10 to 15 per minute game player. The only guys that do have consistent minutes here are Umoja Gibson and Jordan Goldwire. Even Tanner Gross has fluctuated between 33 and 22 minutes in their last three games, and that they had nothing to do with foul trouble, which is a major concern here in a bad game environment. Yamocha Gibson is really cheap for what he provides right now. 18% shot rate, 17.5% assist rate. He's 5K flat, which I think is something you could look to. Jalen Hill's also playing nearly every minute. Doesn't shoot the ball very often, but he's their rebound getter. So potential double-double upside with him. I'd rather just play Yamocha Gibson at his price. And then one really greasy value play is going to be Marvin Johnson, 3,800, but he played 30 minutes in their last game. Now there was a four point victory. So seeing him play that much in a close game is important here. I think CJ Nolan could throw a wrench into this, but Marvin Johnson was banged up for a long time. Seeing him play 30 minutes was a little bit telling here. He's maybe someone to look at, at a minimum near minimum price. Next game, we have Nebraska taking on Ohio state, another potential blowout, Ohio state, 14 and a half point favorite. A little bit of a look ahead here, too. They have Michigan State and Michigan coming up, and Nebraska is the worst team in the Big Ten. Still, the total here is 151.5, giving some intrigue to both both sides of this game. 
Bryce McGowan's has elite rates. He kind of underperformed in their most recent contest, but he's playing over 30 minutes. He has a 22% shot rate, 21% rebound rate, and 16% assist rate last three. Those are just elite numbers here. Outside of that, the rotation is so wide. It's tough to get to anybody in this team. Verge is going to shoot the ball a ton. He's very involved as their main ball handler, but he doesn't play 30 minutes very often. Trey McGowan's plays 30 minutes, but he's seeding so much usage to Bryce McGowan's. Tough to get to. Latman's at 25 minutes. Tough spot. It's probably just Bryce and move on here. Ohio State. EJ Liddell is one of the usage monsters on the slate, but does he get full minutes run in a blowout against Nebraska? I have questions. Rebound rate and shot rate, both north of 20%. If he plays a competitive game, extremely interesting. Malachi Branham has been excellent too as a freshman, playing 33, 34, and 39 minutes, 24.5% shot rate, 33% assist rate. He's still not expensive enough. He might play just 30 minutes in this spot, but I think he is the best play on Ohio State in a vacuum. And I have a lot of interest in him here too. Kyle Young, also a player to mention, just playing elevated minutes compared to what we saw earlier this year. They seem to be phasing out Zed Key in favor of Kyle Young, 5,400, certainly in play against Nebraska. Kansas taking on TCU. We have Kansas as a five and a half point favorite. TCU is a five and a half point underdog. The total 144 and a half, pretty serviceable here overall. Now, Kansas saw the, the return of Remy Martin which is key for them moving forward. I like that they're just trying to ease him into action as we get closer to the conference tournaments. But with that said, Remy Martin still probably not in play, just 11 minutes in their last game. And their slight favorites here. They're still using Dewan Harris a lot. So I'm probably looking elsewhere. You did see Dave McCormick play 31 minutes, which was just absolutely mind-blowing. If you see 30 minutes at any point in the season, his rates are so good that he becomes a very strong option you just have no confidence that's the case in this spot. Again, I, I would be very concerned about Dave McCormick's minutes, but great GPP play with his 25% rebound rate last three, nearly 16% shot rate, also involved with the assists. As far as Agbaji and Brown, they're just so expensive at this point. I think you can find cheaper options. If one of them were healthy, I would be ecstatic, but they both cannibalize each other so much and they're both so involved. It's basically splitting hairs between them. I guess Agbaji for the higher shot rate, but Brown Brown brings more double-double upside. I'm probably not playing either, to be honest, but they're both in play. Jalen Wilson also been more involved lately, GPP option. For TCU, mostly healthy here. Mike Miles plays every single minute, 28% shot rate, 33% assist rate's fantastic. He's not very expensive, but Kansas, they're going to play good defense overall, and Mike Miles in a tougher spot. Outside of him, the rotation is a little wide. Damian Baugh is probably the second player I'm most interested in. 42% assist rate, so more of a peripheral player, but does have the 16% shot rate last three. And outside of that, Eddie Lampkin slowly working his way back from injury 25 minutes in the last contest. Maybe he's a potential play near the minimum. He's 5K, so he's getting close to that value range, but a little risky there as well. Duke taking on Pittsburgh, 14-point spread, 137 total. The theme of this Video is the blowouts that we're potentially going to see on this slate. For Duke, Bancaro is very expensive, but he has some of the best rates on the board involved across statistical categories, 34, 37, and 30 minutes. We've seen his upside on numerous occasions this year. Wendell Moore's taken a backseat to the usage leaders on the team, Bancaro, Mark Williams, and even a guy like Trevor Keels has taken on an elevated role, playing upper 20s, low 30s in minutes. A.J. Griffin's playing kind of the same role. He's a little more involved of late than Keels, but Keels is going to handle the ball more often. So Griffin lives a little more through that shot rate and rebound rate, but those are the cheaper options on Duke I'm looking at. Bancaro's always a payoff option worthwhile in GPPs. Otherwise, I'm paying down for Keels and Griffin. I like them a little bit more here against Pitt. On the Pitt side, we still have Ithiel Horton fairly cheap. He's 5,400. I mean, he's not the same... 4.5K player we had a few days ago, but Ithiel Horton still has a 21.3% shot rate. He rebounds a little bit. He's involved in the periphery. He's still a pretty decent play here. He should be a player that's in the 6.4K range, so maybe 1,000 too cheap with Ithiel Horton. Outside of that, everybody else I feel is fairly priced. Jamarius Burton's been very involved lately, but you have to pay 6,100 for him. Femi Yudukale, more of a peripheral player, so I don't view there being much upside here. John Hughley has double-double upside, but this is a very tough matchup for him against Williams and Bancaro, so probably not the spot to get to him. 
Overall, it's Ithiel Horton for this pit team or move on. Florida taking on Vanderbilt. This spread was just pulled from the board. It opened Florida minus one. Now Florida was plus one. It moved back to a pick them and then it got pulled. So I'm not sure where this is going to go, but the total is 135. Overall in the game, a few things to mention. Deruji is questionable, but he doesn't matter a ton. He's basically a peripheral player at this point. Everything's going through Colin Castleton. And Colin Castleton is somebody you could potentially look at against Vandy, who doesn't necessarily have the best front court game. Now, Castleton plays almost every minute, 22.5% shot rate, 32.5% rebound rate, even a 16% assist rate. There is so much double-double equity here with Castleton in a pretty good matchup against Vanderbilt's 203rd ranked interior defense and poor rebounding unit that I'm comfortable taking Castleton. With the injury to Deruji, we've also seen minutes condensed. Flanders Fleming played 36, 33, and 33 last three. He is above 20% in shot rate, rebound rate, and assist rate in that span, quietly taking on an expanded role down the stretch. Total's not great here, but Flanders Fleming is probably the second most attractive play here. Tyree Appleby also very involved. Higher shot rate, higher assist rate, just not doing as much rebounding-wise. So maybe a little more double-double equity with Fleming, but a higher ceiling with Appleby for the shot rate. On Vandy, couple injuries. We still don't have Rodney Chapman back. Tried to return, re-injured his hamstring. Just a tough scene for him. Jermaine Mann hasn't played in multiple games either. That's condensed minutes for Pippen, and Pippen has such elite rates across the board. He needs to be considered anytime he's in the slate. Near 30% shot rate and assist rate, so like Pippen here a lot. One player we've been getting to a decent amount has been Liam Robbins, and he's still really cheap. Now, a lot of that was because of injury early on. They were easing him back into action Saw 26 and 25 minutes in back-to-back games before fouling out in 15 in their most recent. He draws a tough matchup against Castleton, but he's at 4.9K, and he does have upside to play near 30 minutes if the game is competitive and if he's out of foul trouble. You just don't see a lot of upside like that in this price range. So Liam Robbins, I think, is still in play for Vandy, as is Scottie Pippen. Those are the two main players I'm trying to get to. Maybe Jordan Wright in a GPP, but I think he could be cannibalized by Robbins. And last game we have Michigan taking on Michigan state, huge rivalry, four point spread in favor of Michigan. Michigan state has been taking some money, 142 and a half total. First thing to mention here is I've seen AJ Hogger looking questionable for the game. Apparently it's just cramps. So I don't think there's much to worry about. He played 30 minutes, even with the cramps. So I think Hogger is going to play. Just be aware, watch him in warmups just in case. He's really come on strong of late, 16% shot rate, 36% assist rate. And again, some of that in limited minutes, just know Michigan State doesn't necessarily play the tightest rotation of minutes. So he does run the risk of maybe playing like 28 when you could get similar minutes, maybe in a different spot. But I think Hoggard is still the best player in this slate. The other player that sees a ton of minutes is Max Christie. He just doesn't do a lot with him. He's 4.8K, so you could maybe target him with a near 16% shot rate, but he's basically a wind sprinter. And I'm probably not trying to play anyone else. If I'm getting to Gabe Brown, I'm probably just trying to find the extra money for Hogger. If I'm considering a guy like Tyson Walker, I'm probably just going down and playing Christie. Christie is way more consistent minutes than Tyson Walker. So it's Hoggard, it's Max Christie, or it's move on. For Michigan, they're still playing through, you know, like some of these issues that we saw from the fight. They're not going to have their coach here. But we did see Diabate return and get 30 minutes in his time back on the floor. Debate is a little bit of a foul risk, but 30 minutes from him at 5K is a very strong play, even against Michigan State. So Diabate, I think, firmly in play here. Otherwise, all of the starters play 35-ish minutes. Dickinson, Brooks, Houston, Devontae Jones, and they rotate big games back and forth a little bit to some degree. Dickinson's been on absolute fire, and he's still underpriced at 8,400 for his 23% shot rate, 28% rebound rate. He's been a straight walking double-double down the stretch. And I think he's a very good play here. Interested in Eli Brooks and Houston because of their price. They're 6K and 5.6. So Houston, he's right there too. But honestly, if I'm getting down in that range, I'm probably just playing Diabate. And then Devontae Jones has been extremely involved of late, far more involved than what we saw earlier in the year. So I think Devontae Jones might be a little overpriced compared to his season-long role. He has a 60% assist rate last three, which is just nearly double his season-long rates. I'm not sure I want to buy high there. But that is the DFS slate in a nutshell. Kept it under 20 minutes. Let me know in the comments section who your favorite plays are. I'm Matt Kajeski on Twitter at Matt underscore Kajeski. Thank you for watching, and we'll have more of these 
as the tournament approaches. Thank you and see you again.